This program was brought to you by Collar Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University. Uh, the, uh, we have a very distinguished panel, and uh, I would like to ask the, them to join us uh, as they come. And uh, first of all, we got uh, Nava that uh, you heard in the morning. Uh, so she will uh, be in the panel. Uh, so I guess what they come now, all of them. Uh, how does it go, yeah, in a natural way, yeah? So, uh, yeah, we call them, and uh, Nava doesn't need uh, introduction, Svirsky Sofer, uh, and Dr. Igal Ehrlich uh, is the second one, and then uh, Professor Moshe Sviran. Uh, just a couple of words about the new joiners for the event here. It's uh, Igal Ehrlich, has many, many heads. Uh, the, uh, most people know him as the founder of Yozma. This is not only in Israel, but worldwide, one of the two pioneers. I think he's one of two Israelis who made it into the 100 events of venture, in the history of venture of the last uh, 100 years in our book for that. And uh, he's now the chairman of Hadassit, of Hadassah University Technology Transfer, and in between many other activities, chief scientist. Uh, Moshe Tzviran is uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Management at Tel Aviv University, has been on the faculty for a while, also engaged in business, and uh, he will present not only the School of Business perspective, but I believe he will also speak about from the perspective of the university. Uh, before asking them to give their thoughts, I thought to take a few words. Shall I do it from here or from there? No, it's, uh, I'll stay from here, why not? Uh, I just would like to put things, uh, again, as I see it from, from my, my own perspective. And uh, the way, first of all, administrative-wise, I was asked by uh, Eagle a question. No good? The wire me? Okay, uh, so I don't need this, right? Uh, and the question is, do we do it the Israeli way, yell at each other, or we do it uh, the British way, uh, which is slightly more civilized? Um, so I think I'll go with the UK way. Um, and, and I think that, first of all, I would like to make a comment that, in my view, university is now truly in a, in a crossing point. In that sense, I disagree with uh, one of the comments said earlier, universities survive 1,000 years. Uh, they may survive, but they change the form, need to change the form. And in fact, the very good universities that started in Padua and in other parts of uh, traditional Europe, they're not doing anywhere uh, uh, so well. So I don't think it's a, it's a very good example. Uh, and the reason university has to change is in two, in two, two dimensions. First of all, technology. Uh, there has been discussion in the morning about what digitalization has been done, okay? This is, this is really the biggest disruption, at least since the Industrial Revolution. Probably even bigger than the Industrial Revolution, in terms of impact, what it does. And uh, there are, on, the, on the plus side, there are tremendous new opportunities that we see in engineering, uh, cyber, uh, electrical engineering and other type of you know, innovation, um, biosciences and so on. But there are also the threats. And the threats are coming from the fact that, uh, for instance, just pick up uh, one example, education, you know, knowledge transfer. Uh, we heard before that it's possible to take lectures over the internet and why should you listen to uh, your professor if you can get a better one at another institution about the same material. So, uh, really, there is a, 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 a genuine threat to the, one of the center poles of the university, which is basically to come and to get the best lectures. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, it's not only from another university, it could be from uh, uh, Coursera, it could be from TED, etc., etc. And that's one element, the technology is changing in a way that we, it's really, really disruptive. Uh, we have not have seen anything of that nature for hundreds of years. The second matter has to do with this concept of open universities, of what Benny Sofer called the third wave. 
um, what it means, all this innovation matters to the university. So we do have the bottom-up matters, how to address it. Uh, we have one example, uh, and that example is to have a uh, uh, kindergarten. We just heard this is an example, so that you can foster more what I call clustering for both parents can work. Another example could be here on campus, they decide to designate a room, open room, that what used to be the library, that nobody knows anymore what to do with libraries. So you can go take this room and have people there, sitting there, and to, to basically fuzz and come up with hash out ideas. Table tennis could be another one. That's nice. Is that fundamental? Probably not. We have to think in a bigger way. Um, so it has also to be top down. The top down is coming to Yesha's point. If you recall in the morning, he said the 40 40 20 model, for example, for Tel Aviv University 40 research, 40 education, 20 impact. That's what you said. Very good. Whereas the Weizmann Institute, it is a different ratio. And, and I really agree with. I think it was Yoav now who said that we cannot do them all perfectly. We have to choose. You know, I, I do also some, some business, and I have here my business partner. And people ask me how you spend your time between business and academia. I said it's very easy, 100% and 100%. <laughs> OK, but to take it seriously, it's, it's, uh, we have to make choices, strategic cho choices. We cannot expect our faculty to be innovative and work with the students and excellent teachers and good for the community and be getting tenured on basis of research. It's, people need to make choices and universities need to make choices. But the choices are not just between a Michlala, a college where the focus is more on education vis-a-vis -vis the Weizmann Institute and anything in between. I'll give you more examples where there need to be choices. Choices are, for example, uh, if you are, <laughs> I use the example, if you are Michigan or New York or you are in Atlanta or you are in Manchester, I think the makeup may be different because you need to play to your comparative strengths, okay? And the challenges are very different. If you are uh, remote in a remote area or you are sitting in a, in a large city, you know? And if you go about, we hear this about here in Israel, Tel Aviv has the advantage in some, some sense of being where it is. And we heard the agony of the Technion saying, oh gosh, all our alumni are moving to Tel Aviv. And, and, and that's, that's a fair point. So it has a lot of mean, uh, implications here. Now we see the pressures, and I'm coming from London Business School. We hear a question we never heard before. When the students come, they don't ask only, well, they know how good or, 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 or not good, but in our case, I think we're good in terms of education is and what is the diploma worth. But I also ask, okay, what do you also do to us in terms of fostering innovation and entrepreneurship? Do you help if we want to take entrepreneurship a job? Which is unheard of a few years ago. Am I supposed to provide them funding or, or to use my network? We know the answer. Yeah, we have a good network, which is important. But that's, this is how people are being judged, because getting a job in banking and consulting is uh, not enough these days. It's not as lucrative as used to be, perhaps, or, and innovation is a big matter. And I can tell you, I'm meeting presidents of, of European, primarily universities, very often. And every elected new president of a university in Europe, if you ask them, what is the main things that you see for yourself as a motto for your uh, term? Guess what it is, they will say. Entrepreneurship, innovation, you choose the world. Technology translate, absolutely immersing with the community. And these are colleges, um, these are universities that are known for liberal arts, known for hard sciences. They never cared about the community in the way we care more in Israel. Now they, they are in an in alarming different stage of nature. So this is all very, I would say, exciting uh, matters. And then again, uh, the use, uh, you have mentioned the alumni, and I repeat it again, I, and, and Ronnie mentioned it too, alumni plays a, a major role in terms of this networking. 
And um, so that's, that's part of the equation. The last thing is the issue of governance. And the, there has not been much academic research, I, I, and I checked, there's been some. But the academic research also looks at the governance matter. What should change in the governance? Who are the stakeholders? And again, because you change a business model, perhaps the, 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 uh, the stakeholders now have different weights, different uh, makeup. Um, for instance, the ecosystem of the VCs, the alumni in a different capacity, uh, and the government, all of these now be, get another dimension, another importance to them. The boundaries of the university change. I give you uh, uh, a couple of examples to, to, uh, to, uh, to demonstrate it. The biggest change on technology transfer and innovation at universities in the United States and perhaps beyond happened because of the Bay Dole Act in the United States. I don't have the date yet, but it's in our 100 events. 1980. 1980, that's, that sounds right. Thank you. 1980. What it, do, what it did is to facilitate the transfer of IP rights by two universities and uni from universities onward where you need to keep in mind that a lot of it was backed also by the federal government, and which is similar to chief scientists here, and they had, you know, first right, they put a lot of restrictions, all of a sudden they removed that, they say universities, go ahead, you know, take it further. That triggered a major impact in the, U in the U uh, USA, and further was emulated elsewhere in the world. Uh, this is uh, the triple uh, helix configuration, and uh, really made a big, big impact. One area that we saw this as well was the UK. Uh, we got the uh, Lambert Review in 2003, the uh, Sainsbury Report in 2007. They implemented a lot, a lot of these uh, ideas. Uh, also talking about what I know better is the UK, is this knowledge transfer program that was put together by the, by the US government. And that uh, brings me to my last point, is the role of government. That's a point that was actually was missing for, for the whole day, which is good for me, so I have something to say. Um, you know, uh, and that's, what about the government? Talk about stakeholders, what about the government? And that's, maybe I will ask, you know, uh, Eagle in his usual head of still Yosma, you know, is there a time here to, to think about it in a better way? Because I think that the government also need to put its weight, which it has, on the funding equation, uh, influencing the strategic directions of universities, and we know how this is being done through, through the budget. Now, I can tell you that this happened in the UK and has been very, very powerful. In the UK, we have the REF exercise. This is the Research Excellent Framework. Universities are being measured and they get you know, whether they are five star or four star, whatever. And that dictates how much budget they have. Traditionally, this was based on research output and quality, teaching, and that's about it. Now, innovation, entrepreneurship is part of the equation. You move, you move the needle, all right? Now, I don't think this is here, maybe I'm wrong, and definitely not in a, in, 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 in a high degree. So again, the government has a very phenomenal tool, which is called the, the, the funding, to make the influence here as well. Uh, something equivalent to this research excellence uh, framework in terms of government inter intervention and the role of the different stakeholders. Um, so what I would like to do before opening this up, the whole forum, and let the panelists to respond, I would like to start with, uh, Eagle and Moshe and, and asks each of them to comment and specifically to Eagle regarding perhaps this role of government or any other thing he wants to say and to Moshe regarding the role of the business school or the university in terms of addressing some of these issues that I, I, I mentioned and how you do it in, you know, or particularly given the, the fact that you do need to have a cluster, you do need to, to focus on specialization why should, how do you distinguish Tel Aviv University from other universities in the global sense as to why are you unique, what do you choose? 
Anyway, I will start uh, with eagerly, if I may. <coughs> okay, I thought that the, this meeting will be more. Uh, I'm talking from here. No, no, this goes somewhere else, and this goes somewhere else. Okay. okay. That's technology. You've got two mics. Two mics. Two mics. I thought it will be a kind of uh, discussion between. Uh, between us and, the, and other people, and uh, I don't think that it should continue as it was uh, during the day, but I, I would like uh, to hear also what people are th uh, think here, and, and I want to say something about what Eli asked, and uh, maybe it will create something uh, in you. Uh, so we all agree that the universities have uh, uh, assets, have intellectual assets. I think we all agree also that they are not completely used in a way. So a major part of it goes to a reservoir of knowledge. Some part of it, a small part, is commercialized. And according to the numbers we heard today, it's not a big part. In Israel, it's not a big part. Even if you look at Weizmann Institute, it was a leader in, in a, uh, royalties from their inventions. I don't think that they have in the last 10 years any new invention that is going to create income to, uh, to Weizmann. I, I, I think, I'm not sure that I might, but I think this is a situation. And I'm not sure that we see in other universities some breakthroughs that will, like Weizmann has with the Copaxon, which is good until today, which will save, let's say, the university's uh, financial position in the near future. So the question, the big question is, uh, uh, are there assets that can be uh, commercialized, used, or not? I don't know. We all agree, we all think that there are. It's not secret that uh, uh, in the European Commission, and I was part of the, the beginning of the planning of the new program 2020, Horizon 2020, that there was a big criticism in Europe about putting too much money into the university, into basic research, because we don't see enough results. So the smart people, what they did is they took one of the big division, that was the science division that had a lot of money, and they add one word to this division, and they call it now, for since then, the Science and Innovation Division. And that's what the way to take some of the, of the financing in the European Commission towards commercialization of uh, research which is done in the university. So there is understanding that university should be much more uh, a player in utilize what they have. And, and as I said, the results are not so. Now, there are many problems of uh, culture. Uh, we all know that, and we saw it in the recommendation here, there is a need to do some more transparency between uh, universities and others. There, are, there is a need to work in teams. There, there is a need to change maybe the ego of the professors. I don't know, many things you have to do in order to change and to start to utilize better uh, the asset that uh, universities have. But I'm not sure that this is easy or it will uh, be fast. So maybe the way that uh, uh, should be uh, thinking by all parties, which are the government, the industry, and, and the universities, uh, uh, in order to find how to exploit this, this uh, and know-how and asset that we have in here, is to uh, look how to commercialize it in the best way. And the government here has a very important role because I don't think that these three parties can do something without having the government, and the government role here is mainly financing. Because once you see financing, you are moving to hear what they have to say. And if the government think, and it can be, you know, the Ministry of uh, Economy or, or the Ministry of Finance or whoever, 
if they think or they will be convinced that we are losing time and losing asset here because we are not utilizing it, the way they have to find a way how to do uh, through financing, and many ideas uh, were running in uh, uh, before, like having a, a team between uh, students and professors and trying to uh, uh, teach towards more entrepreneurial uh, academy rather than just uh, uh, as it, it is done today. I believe that there are ways to find a, a budget for that. I think that, the, at least from what I know, the chief scientist's office, uh, they have to think what is changing. They have to think what will be the future of the universities because, you know, until today, the research or the money for research or the money for technology from investors and also from others is, uh, is went m mainly for new products, for new ideas, for new uh, horizons to achieve targets which were not achievable. Uh, it is changing a bit now because what we see where the money is moving is to solving problems or looking where is the pain. And, and many good companies which don't even need uh, technology, too, too deep technology, are uh, established now and become uh, very valuable because they find ways how to make life easier, how to change things, and they call it disruptive, it's a nice word now, and I'm afraid that this disruptive technology will get into education as well. You mentioned it, and I think, Moshe, you have to talk about it because this is a big threat on the universities. So why not the research in the university start to think in a way, not just what is new or what is, you know, let's, let's invent a new world, but also what can be changed through technology, through new technology in what we have. So these are open questions which, if we have some plan to answer them and to involve the government, I believe the government should have here a very uh, important and big role, and I'm sure that they will accept this role because they're also looking for what shall, uh, what shall be done. By the way, just as a, in brackets, uh, I told some people here, you know, that uh, the government was uh, in the last year, so since I was a chief scientist, was bothered with the problem of how to finance new companies. Or oh, the seed funding, which is not only in the universities, also by entrepreneurs. Uh, seed money was the most important thing for the government because this was obvious that nobody is investing in seed, so the government should do it. Otherwise, we will not have companies. What happened today, in the venture capital ecosystem, something different. In the last year, what we see is the seed stage is well financed. In a way, it does not come to the universities, but think about it. What we did not have before and we have now, we have uh, angels. I, I must, you know, I have even a chart uh, from a company called IVC, which is owned by the Boltzmann. It's the best data mining for, for technology in Israel and venture capital. And they show that there are today in Israel about 20, 22 incubators, most of them financed by the government. In these incubators, you have companies which can get seed money. We have micro funds, we have 19 micro funds funds which are not more than $5 million. They are looking for seed money for entrepreneurs to invest money. We have crowdfunding, of course, which is a new tool. We have uh, super uh, 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 angels, but we have also supportive centers of big companies. So today, if you are entrepreneurs with an idea, even not uh, too far uh, on the way, you can go to one of these centers, for instance, go to AT&T, they, they have a center in Israel. You can talk to these people about your idea. Probably they will not take it to AT&T even if it's a great idea.
because these companies don't want to, to, to deal with seed ideas. But they will tell you what to do. They will try to connect you because they believe that in the future they may use it. So many corporate are doing it in Israel. It's a very uh, open door for, for seed money for entrepreneurs. And there are also the corporate funds. So these are only the seed stage. Seed stage, I mean, investment which are not more than $2 million. Do you see them here in the university, this type of money? I don't know. Do you have to see them? Of course, find a way how you can use it. Uh, of course, the, the ecosystem, it's not only seed money. There are uh, not more than, by the way, 15 Israeli funds, Israeli funds, which we had in the, in the past about 50 or 60. So today we have only 15 uh, Israeli funds that have about up to $150 million. They are investing in companies which are already develop a product. Eden, but you, with your head of had a seat, do you also see them going into what we call the deep innovation, into uh, pharma, into, uh, would that be interested as well, these guys, uh, these incubators? seat? I mean, no, I mean, these sources that you talked about, are they also relevant, not for the IT Yes, side? look, uh, we, we have to, uh, of course, we talk, discovery? we talk, I talk and everybody, gets except you maybe, talk generally. But uh, of course the market is fragmented. It's, it's different in life science than in high tech. Uh, in the, and in high tech there are many, still you have fragmentation uh, there as well. So uh, in, in life science it's, it's a bit different story. But uh, uh, still all this financing for seed, not all of it can be in uh, life science as well. But still, you can find angel and other investment going into seed financing of uh, device companies and <coughs> drug companies. You can see it. And there are very famous angels who are doing investment in, in seed, in uh, developing new drugs. They also talk to universities. They also talk to the TTOs. <laughs> Benny knows. I don't know if you, he was not there in the Technion. But we did a seed financing with the Technion. He's a very good entrepreneur. We were very successful. The problem was, and it's still the problem, I think, of the TTOs and the universities, that the people that have a good idea and are ready to, and they are good also as, uh, let's say, potential business people, they try to bypass the university in a way. And, and uh, I mean, it's because, I don't know why, because it's, they do it, they do it. I don't know if today, but I know they used to do it. I'm sure that in, the, in this university, I don't know if Moshe would like to talk about it, but there are some of this kind as well. But still, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's something which you see that entrepreneurs or, or professors from, uh, from academia can get seed money. If it's in the underground or on the table, it should be solved, of course. Uh, by doll, try to solve the problem in the U.S. successfully, because they just created the rule between the university and the, and the professors who gets what, and this was, you know, uh, fixed. So uh, just to uh, to finish the the ecosystem of the venture capital that I started to say, I want you to know that. Uh, the Israeli funds and some other funds and some corporate ventures are investing in what we call round A and B, which is about $10 million investment in a company. And there are today in Israel many foreign funds, including some Israeli funds, which are more than $200 million, that invest even $20 million in a company. So the market, the financial market, the venture capital market in Israel is very competitive, very active, and in a way, it's far from the universities. A government, by the way, is not involved at all in the venture capital anymore. Uh, it should be involved. I think they less should be involved in seed because there is a solution now, I think, in the market. By the way, the fact that there is a lot of money now for seed means that for the venture capital, which will come after, 
is a very good phenomenon because of the screening. They, they do a good job for, to invest after them. Anyway, I think that uh, these, are these are the big questions and the, um, to be discussed, you know, to come with a solution, not by uh, details, uh -huh. but as a plan for the government together with the, with the industry, with the universities, try to solve the problem of the future, of the near future of the university, try to explain there is a danger because of the disruptive technology and because of what's happened now also in, in the financing for universities. I think the government should continue without any relation to continue with the basic research, no doubt. The question if the professor should be independent as they are today, you know, that will be always the question and uh, we will not uh, win anyway. So uh, with the reality that exists, we have to find a solution, I think, with this three parties. Otherwise, it will cripple again. Now, I, <clears throat> I'm eager to uh, again, get, get, uh, get the panel going first, and then we can open this up. So I'm shutting up, first of all, my mouth. I have to say something. And, and ask Moshe to move on, and then have a I can shut mine if you want. <laughs> Uh, I'll try to be short. I mean, uh, good evening, first of all. Uh, I could probably sit here and take all the time until uh, dinner and the reception. I'll try to focus on uh, about seven minutes. Uh, first, I, I apologize that I couldn't take part in the team's work, but I listened here very carefully, and my reactions were threefold. Uh, first of all, I smiled at some of the comments because like an experienced uh, lecturer, I have the answer on a slide, which means I know the answers of, the, of some of the issues that were raised and I was very happy about it and I'll discuss some of them. Um, I took note of some of the comments that are very interesting and actually I uh, will probably look in the near future on how to take them to work and how to implement them. And I do disagree with some of them, but you know, this is academia, you don't need to agree with everything. But uh, having said that, you know, uh, the last presentation was by uh, Team One, and one of the uh, uh, issues they raised is, there, is that there is or shouldn't be any change uh, in the university model of doing uh, research, teaching, and the other things we're doing. And you know, the, the reason I smiled at this one is because about two decades ago, I read a book by Jim Collins. I don't know how many of you have read the book called Build to Last. Build to Last was about 19 companies that existed for 100 years, university are 1,000 years old. And they are here to be, okay? One of them, by the way, was Kodak that almost disappeared and is trying to reinvent itself. And there are many other companies that are not on the list anymore. And by the way, when he wrote it, uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook were not even conceived. So, and I think Mark Zuckerberg was in elementary school. So, uh, the world is changing and there is not one industry and or institution that shouldn't be aware of the disruptive technology and the changing, very fast changing world. And it, I have no doubts that it will impact our world as well with one comment that I will say with a smile, probably by the time it will change, I will also be retired. So I don't worry personally, but having said that, the model is going to change. Um, and there is threat, and it was mentioned earlier. Uh, I try to, you know, I'll give you some anecdotes from my day-to-day -day life. Uh, I had, we had at the department, an exceptionally good PhD students that uh, graduated cum laude, and they, we encouraged him to go and pursue postdoc abroad with the idea that he will come back to us and we'll be very happy. And he did take a postdoc abroad at Google Labs. Now go and bring him back from Google Labs. You know, I'm struggling to get some data for doing some data-oriented research. The guy is sitting on the Google database. Why should he come back here? I'm trying to get them some funds, you know, get some bits and bytes of funds. These are not the amounts that he has at Google Labs. So he does us a favor and comes one, once annually to attend our conferences and our seminars, but he's there. We do have a, an initial change. It doesn't yet happen, I believe, 
in life sciences, not to this extent, but definitely, you know, uh, those of you that are familiar with the Tel Aviv campus, we clearly distinguish, for many reasons, east and west. Uh, the east is considered to be this part of the campus. It's considered to be the heart of sciences with engineering, computer science, life sciences, med, and so on and so forth. And the west is closer to the beach, which means that uh, <laughs> the, the west uh, consists of the, the, the uh, liberal arts, uh, social uh, uh, law management, and so on and so forth. But uh, if I'm looking at, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take just the, 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 even the, the west part, which is an integral part of the university, we're definitely threatened by uh, Google campus, uh, Microsoft campus, and other campuses, and it will not st stop at the School of Management and or the Econ Department. It will go further. It will go to computer science. It is already there, okay? With, for instance, cyber. Many of the cyber scientists go to the industry rather than staying in the academia. They are not developing algorithms, they are doing actual research, actually some of them are even publishing. So guys, there is a threat. We can ignore it, we can say it's not just me, it will probably be after your retirement, but it is here. So this is uh, 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 number one. Um, Ellie mentioned that presidents of universities that he met, uh, the number one issue on their agenda is entrepreneurship. First of all, why? because it is a modern, it's the bon ton. No, but it's more than that. If you look at the development of economies, basically, uh, you know, there are different uh, terms used. It could be venture, entrepreneurship, innovation. I like all of them. You know, we have a, a, I'm coming from the IT arena, and when we want them to threaten management, we use TLA. TLA is three-letter acronym. So, uh, you know, you go to the uh, CEO and you tell him that you need the SAP of the IBM of the no, no, no. He says, how much and let me go. So, uh, using TLA, we call it V, which is also life, but it's venture innovation entrepreneurship. But this is basically the core of the new economies. It, we are not anymore in the industrial world, we're in the informational world, and entrepreneurship there is a major, probably the major ingredient. And if you look at the triple helix model, university has a part in it, and it will have a part in it. But I'm trying to look at the part and, of our part and see what can we do, how can we do it, and what is the role of university in general, but you know, I'm, I'm narrowly focused. I'm at Tel Aviv, no, let, let me further narrow it down. I'm at the School of Management at Tel Aviv University at the State of Israel, I'm unfortunately not yet at Stanford, so I'm looking at what can we do to do to this country's economy, to this university, uh, to my school, uh, so you know, I can sit here comfortably and say, hey guys, you know, I could stand here and say our MBA program is ranked number 11 in entrepreneurship innovation and it is, you know, the, the ranking is by the number of entrepreneurs that raise money from VCs worldwide. And number one is Stanford, number two is Harvard and so on and so forth, but we are in a good company. And maybe Harvard and Stanford should uh, beware because we are uh, making an advance, well, I'm joking. Having said that though, um, Yesha in his speech said that uh, Statistics can be looked in different ways. Our entrepreneurs don't come from management. 55% of our students are engineers as undergrads. Others come from life sciences. So all, the only thing we are doing, in addition to giving them the MBA, is teaching them on how to do entrepreneurship and how to manage entrepreneurship. But they come from the east side, if you want to call it this way. So what is our role as a school and what is our role as a university? And I'll, try with the micro, I'll start with the micro perspective and go further to the uh, university perspective. Uh, one of the, those of you that don't come from uh, management, uh, one of the courses we teach in management is, as you can imagine, it's a strategy. And before I became dean, I was vice dean, My, the, the former dean was uh, Professor Tischler, and both of us uh, know something about strategy, and we were sitting for hours and hours to realize what will be the value proposition of our school. Who are we and where are we going? And number one in strategy is understanding what you are not. And it was obvious that we cannot be number one or among the top schools in uh, strategy because research and teaching because nobody can compete with Harvard. Same thing goes for finance. Unfortunately, you cannot compete with Wharton. You are at Wharton. And the third, I cannot compete. 
And the, the, the third, you know, if you want to go along the same lines, Kellogg moves the world in marketing, Kellogg and Northwestern, we're doomed. So where, where, where are we? And you know, uh, I'm, I keep on telling this story. We were uh, meeting our advisory board in New York. And actually, our board said, I, we, we don't see, you know, you, you're looking around, but you should actually look basically <coughs> under the light because you are the startup nation, whatever, and you should look at entrepreneurship innovation on the way from the 6th Avenue to his hotel, which was 5th and 45. Uh, we drafted, first of all, the plan for our entrepreneurship and innovation MBA, and secondly, what will be the research implications and so on and so forth. So, uh, and during these years, this is exactly what we promoted. We promoted entrepreneurship innovation at the school. It's the eighth year now. So, you know, just, just to give you <coughs> uh, some of the highlights, what we are doing, and it goes along the same lines of what you recommended. We have uh, an MBA program on entrepreneurship and innovation. We have faculty that is doing all the areas of management, but with a focus on entrepreneurship innovation, which means marketing, financing, legal, you mentioned everything that uh, basically we're researching in terms of microfunding and, and, out, and uh, crowdsourcing and so on. We, we, we look at the people in strategy, they are looking at innovation and entrepreneurship strategy and so on and so forth. So we're trying to focus them uh, in, in our agenda. And th so that is number uh, one. Number two, yes, for years, you know, uh, when I'm asked how many faculty you have, uh, the first thing I say is less than life sciences and liberal arts. And the second say, thing I say is you need to split it into two. We have six, about 60 faculty full-time uh, tenure track faculty members, but we have 250 more that come from the industry to bring the knowledge from the industry to the academia and actually work together. So some leading entrepreneurs are teaching uh, at our school, some uh, leading VC people are teaching at our school in order to, you know, to take the academic ideas and bring them uh, to uh, reality. Uh, we have joint programs with basically every unit. The strength of the Tel Aviv University is that unlike Weizmann, for instance, we do have, it's an advantage by the way, liberal arts and economics and the School of Engineering and actually the School of Arts and even uh, the uh, social sciences and we team up with them. We have joint programs and joint researchers with all those faculties simply to make sure that it is one entity and we take advantage of our capabilities. Uh, we sure. talked about... One more minute. Three. We, you know, I have the mic. Uh, we talk about uh, partnering with, uh, uh, with the world. We have exchange programs with 100... I think I, I checked it this morning. We have exchange programs for our, currently for only for our graduates, the MBA students, with 103 universities around the world. It's not just US. We have Europe, we have China, we have Korea, we have Japan. Many of the students are reluctant to go into these places, but um, well, they go because not all of them are admitted to Kellogg because we have only five slots in Kellogg. Uh, we, we are running hackathons and we, have, uh, we send our entrepreneurship and innovation students, only the winning teams, to accelerators abroad, not in Israel. We send them to accelerators abroad to make sure that they take the idea one step further. We have an in-house pre-accelerator so they can test it, they do go through the hackathon, they go through the pitches, and then they are, they, some of the groups are selected to go abroad. So what, what I'm trying to hint, what I'm trying to hint is that we are trying to move from the ivory tower to actually be the light tower of this uh, industry. And I told Eli that I'm going to talk a little bit about the university, so I'm done with the School of Management, but give me one more minute because I think that uh, not everybody knows what the university uh, uh, does. Tel Aviv University decided informally to become more entrepreneurial. So what we're doing is that uh, voluntarily, by the way, the School of Management came to the president and said, uh, we're going to, vo to volunteer a cluster of classes on entrepreneurship innovation. Because you have great engineers, you have great people in life sciences and so on, but they have no clue what to do with their ideas even in, at the undergrad level. But, and all of them want to become entrepreneurs, and they fail. The failure rate is, what, 95 96% or less, if we can just raise this one. So we're teaching these students on how to start looking at a business plan and how to manage people. They have no clue that they have to manage people and how to do it. And how to go to the customer, because they don't care about the customer. They are focused on their idea. 
Uh, if everything works fine, David Mendelovich was here, we are going to have an in-house accelerator. So if we have this same conference three years down the road, hopefully I'll be here and not just telling you what we are going to do, but also what we have done. And we are certainly going to accomplish more things in the years to come and make it a true entrepreneurial university that will probably be the, be the light hour of entrepreneurship and innovation in Israel. Thank you, Moshe. Uh, now, I don't have a specific question to you. Uh, so it's, it's your podium. Wow. Mm -hmm. Given the time and the fact that I did have the floor this morning, there are three very brief points I want to make. And I do apologize because I didn't hear all the groups, uh, but I think it dovetails nicely with what's been said until now. First point is relevance. Really, to me, what we've been hearing and part of what Moshe has been responding to, part of Ellie's comments and some of the other comments uh, earlier today, go to the relevance of the university as it currently stands and how to remain relevant in a changing world. Now, be it moving into areas that you're not in at the moment, like having your own accelerator or having your own funds or having... Uh, taking things further down the line on the commercial side or becoming more involved with industry or having industry on campus. There are many, many things you do, but I think the overriding uh, issue that we need to look into further, Yesha, is the question of relevance and how do you stay relevant. The second point is culture. How many academics in the room? Just a show of hands. A good number. You'll appreciate this. A uh, good friend of mine, a venture capitalist, did me the favor of replacing me at a speaking uh, engagement uh, abroad the other week. And um, this was held at a university at a center of entrepreneurship. And uh, he came back and he said, you know, uh, I said, well, how was it? He said, well, you know, there was the speech, there was a panel, there were companies, <coughs> he said, and they had this very interesting thing. I'd never seen this done before. He said they had a poster session. Hmm. Okay, so. Now, very smart guy, very experienced venture capitalist, but you know, poster sessions are not, they're not part of his culture, they're not part of his world, he's never seen them, he doesn't know what they are. Um, he thought it was quite an interesting idea. Um, <coughs> and that's just a very minor illustration of how different the cultures are. I've worked within these different cultures for so many years and still I'm always surprised that how different they are, how different the language is, and not just in the life sciences or the exact sciences, but just in general between the academic world and the world of business. Um, so I think that is something that we need to address as well, is how we bring these cultures closer together. Some of the ideas were raised, some of the things we have all done in previous roles of bringing the different stakeholders together. But I think culture remains a um, challenge that we need to address. And then the third and last point was also my very first point this morning, and that is impact. And the question is, what impact do universities want to have what impact do they measure? Because you typically measure what you set out to achieve. I mentioned this morning, I showed, most of you were here this morning, the surveys that were released the, over this past week by both Harvard and MIT. Um, there are major differences between them, especially what I had pointed out this morning, the whole issue of uh, involvement in volunteering and volunteer work and community work sustainability, which Harvard looked at more closely. And I think that is a very, very important question. What impact do we want to have? Economic impact, environmental impact, um, human impact or impact on human lives around the world, so on and so forth, business, of course. So to me, those are the three overriding themes that come out of all of this, relevance, culture, and impact. And um, I would... Personally, I think if we have a bit of time, I'd love to have a chance to engage in maybe a bit of discussion, even, Yesha, before the food. No, no, but that's the idea. Uh, you had a chance to speak between yourself and to send your delegates here. We do have now a good, uh, good amount of time to open this up, <laughs> as we should have done long, long, long ago. Yes, please. My name is Jacob problems uh, that uh, were discussed here uh, lie in Israel. Uh, I, I heard that uh, people referred to, uh, to Israel. So here I have a copy of a draft of a chapter that I was involved
involved in, in the law of arrangements, <laughs> translated from the Hebrew, Hoka is the ring, from 2010. And uh, the uh, title was Economic Steps and Structural Changes in R&D and Industry. And the subtitle was Formation and Focus of R&D Policy uh, in Israel. And it starts, we decide, Mahlitim, you know, the government decides. And then it goes on, uh, and the whole chapter was about setting priorities in R&D in government uh, uh, finance, uh, which would include also about 5 billion shekels that is distributed by the uh, Planning and Budgeting Committee of Israel, Batal, okay, which is much more money than uh, is available to the chief scientist. And the idea was to say that not more than half of this money <coughs> would have priorities set by the government, by a body that uh, would be uh, under the, the control of the government, which is the case in other countries. I showed it to my former students at the uh, budgets department of the finance uh, ministry, and uh, they accepted it, and we wrote a whole chapter about that. And uh, what happened was that this chapter was erased from the law of arrangements, from Hawkeye's Derib, because of resistance by the academic establishment. And this is what is going on in Israel for years. And I, I showed the uh, uh, management team of the finance uh, ministry, by invitation, they invited me to, to give a, a talk there, how things are done in other countries. For example, I, I have here, uh, this is, Science and Technology Priorities for the Fiscal Year 2017 Budget by the, uh, by the Americans. I mean, this is a document setting the priorities of the American president, and it is written by the uh, uh, OMB, the Office of Management and Budgets of the, uh, the American uh, Office of Management and Budgets, and the uh, Office of Science and Technology. In but, but Jacob, the White excuse House. me, what's the point? That the government is not ideal? What, what, I don't understand. Or the, 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 the academia is. The, is the uh, academia there is politics here. inside the academia? The, the point is that the academy here is not, not controlled at all. There is no way that the government can set priorities or policy in academia. That's the basic problem. This, this is the basic problem in Israel, which is not the case, for example, in the UK. Yeah. In the UK, for example, the uh, ministry, the Biz, Business Innovations and Skills Office, is setting the policy for higher education. Absolutely, you're right. Okay, and, and the VATAT, uh, their VATAT, which I, I call the VAT, because it is only the, the uh, FK, the, uh, the Higher Education Funding Council for England, is implementing the policy. It is not the, the one that creates policy. Here in Israel, the government doesn't have any say. Interesting. Doesn't have any say. And this is because uh, the government does not understand what is going on, what is happening elsewhere in the world. Um, okay, I, I, I again, I'm this. biting my tongue but, uh, in the interest to, to to give you guys the chance to speak. So please, but make it in the, you know, make it short so that we can go around. Can yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, 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 no, 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 go, go ahead. The issue of uh, technology transfer is discussed from the, the first group. Just raise your voice, please. Yeah. Yeah. Speak up. Hi, Asaf. My name is Asaf The issue of the TTOs was touched by a gentleman from group two and then from group four with a gentle hint. 
I can share with you as an entrepreneur and having a similar discussion just yesterday with one of the more famous entrepreneurs in Israel who spent quite a lot of time dealing with PTOs from Weizmann and other places, that this is a major Chinese wall between the industry and the academia today. And I would uh, encourage, with all the strategy expertise, finance expertise, etc., that uh, you mentioned, to uh, go into this topic very deeply and solve it once and for all. Because the notion of, for example, having a duplicate of the model of biotechnology into high tech is ballooning. It's totally different industry, different finding, financing required, different exit model uh, implemented. Nobody is willing to even consider 1% royalty. It's out of the question. Not to mention the bureaucracy of even reaching an agreement, which we're used to deal with things in a matter of 24 hours, not lengthy negotiations. So as a result, there is an image has been built with seasoned entrepreneurs of just staying away from anything that has to do with PTOs. Mm. I uh, yeah, to, please. Uh, a few words. My name is Shlomo Nimrodi. I'm heading the Business Engagement Center at Tel Aviv University. I encourage you to come and deal with Tel Aviv University to uh, take some technologies, okay? But are you hopefully saying constraints? Oh, I'm sorry? It seems Shlomo is an entrepreneur. He's doing business yeah. now. So let me, uh, let me explain. I mean, first of all, you know, it's very easy to throw darts at the uh, no, no, tech no, no, transfers. Sorry? Does the government or the university or anybody impede your freedom in terms of negotiating? Yeah, let, let me tell you what. Uh, and again, I'm sorry I couldn't be here all day. I'm dealing with what uh, Moshe talked about, uh, making this university as the center of innovation in the state of Israel. So I couldn't come earlier. But I want to say a few, few words. Uh, there is always room for improvement in every aspect of, of the value system of entrepreneurship. Uh, to me, and, and my background, I've been in industry for 25 years before I came to the university. I've been in entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, I've been in Indigo, many other companies, I won't name them because most of you probably don't know them, but I came here about four years ago, three and a half years ago, and I sympathize with many things that were, were said here. I think interdisciplinary research is key. I think Tel Aviv University is doing some unique things in terms of creating an interdisciplinary environment. I can't agree with you more. The business model of tech transfer is not identical for pharma and high tech. Totally two different businesses. I think we're fortunate as a country to have 300 MNCs, multinationals, a few miles away from here. And that puts the state of Israel and the university in Israel in, Israel in a very unique position. The fact that we can get to GE and GM and Google uh, uh, and all these high-tech, mostly high-tech companies is huge. The biggest challenge there, no pharma companies, almost no pharma companies. That's a huge gap that we have here in the industry. Uh, the chief scientist is doing an unbelievable work. In fact, the chief scientist doesn't finish all the budget they have for every year to allocate for early stage innovation. There are programs that all, of, all the universities are actually getting millions of shekels, every millions of dollars every year. And I can tell you, not all the science we bring pass the bar. The challenge we have is to increase the level of academic research. To me, that's the biggest challenge. And the way to do that, we need to be able to bring new scientists from abroad. I mean, Tel Aviv has done an outstanding job in bringing, I think, more than, yeah, you, you know the numbers, more than 300 scientists. No, no, what I said is that we need to increase the level of academic research. And what the problem It's one of the issues. Because if you look at the, at the gap, at least in terms of drug development, there is a huge gap between what the industry is looking and what academic institutions are able to bring. If you were to run a survey, Okay, I can tell you that, and I don't speak of my, myself, my colleagues as well, 
They license anywhere from 30 to 50 license agreements every year, and they found between 10 and 20. I love the discussion, Maybe but just in case, is, is there somebody Israeli, else? Israeli, but let me give you statistics. Why? But let me give you statistics. Eli, Eli, is a matim the reception? Yes. 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 We have two more minutes. I, let's continue over drinks, guys. Let's continue over drinks. He came late, he will stay late. Uh, okay, more questions. People who didn't speak so far. Yes, please. You have. Yes, as coming from the School of Chemistry, it sounds like we have a fantastic business school. It's the first time I hear about it. You're not the only one, believe me. You're right. You're right. That's a global university. You don't know your other part. Most of our commercialization are coming from the School of Chemistry. The, 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 the School of Chemistry. With many of our innovations. And we, have, we don't know anything about the venture entrepreneurship and, 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 and there. We want to. Help us get there. <laughs> well, the Kohler Institute of Venture is a global school. We manage even to share some knowledge between the east side and the west side of the two of this campus. Uh, uh, let's have. Uh, we need to go by by the junior just as a company. I need, to, need let to go. It, yeah. Just a sec. We need to go to the med school because some of the veins are blocked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I just You're talking about East and West, although there is a separation. Music, uh, students, and, and medicine, and, and you know, geology, and geography, and cell biology, and, and you know, and... and uh, guys, guys, and what? No, no, guys, uh, this, is, this is not Tel Aviv University event. Just a minute, just a minute. That's one point. The other point is the skill that you were saying. How should we work? So there is, uh, we mentioned earlier NSF. There is an NSF center scheme where you bring uh, industry and academia at the same point and you do it. And Tel Aviv University just became one of the NSF sites, center sites. So we will try to do that as well. So that's not, um, you know, that's not a barrier. Still, the EU, <laughs> did invest many, uh, you know, huge resources in the various program five, six, seven, and now they are trying to utilize what they did already, but they still invest, and it was just announced yesterday, a huge amount of basic science in brain and other area to, to promote in both Thank areas. you, Mira. And that should be just the last point. No, no, we have to move on, I'm sorry. It's not, we have to move from Tel Aviv University. Is there another point? I would like to have somebody to say the last word if it's not related to Tel Aviv University, <laughs> but to the general discussion that we have. And then I will move it on to Yesha. Or maybe one of the panel, unless, not Tel Aviv University. For sure. You're sure? Uh, so, so, I'm not from the United States. And Jersey. Jersey is technology. Jersey is like, so it's like, yeah, <laughs> same size. <laughs> Lots of different voices were able to argue. People got a little passionate at times, but ideas kind of floated to the top. I think that this is really a contribution. This particular form of contribution would be much better widely disseminated because just this conversation allows somebody from chemistry to learn about you know, other things. So, 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 so this is this opening up is something that needs to be done much more broadly. The ivory tower tends to be siloed. And the answer is the more we can break these things down, the more we can actually. You are definitely not Israeli. The way you talk, you, to give compliments, you are not Israeli. You prove the point. 
Uh, yes, sir. Uh, maybe right. before that. It's because you are naive, not because of that. Okay. Before one comment. One comment. No, I, because, you know, I can't resist the temptation of saying one thing, uh, since, you know, I have the mic, uh, about tech transfer. Uh, because Roman wasn't here this morning, he didn't see that I presented the comparative data that was gathered by the Central Bureau of Statistics, which indeed shows that Israel is doing very, very well uh, compared with other countries. It is my experience that the issues raised by Asaf and others are universal. They're not specific to Tel Aviv University or indeed to Israel. Um, it is part of my second point, which was culture. And it's something that we need to do a much better job with. Uh, regarding you know, life sciences and uh, other, particularly computer science, of course you need different models. They're completely different industries. Um, I know for myself that we, frankly, invented a whole number of different models to get away from exactly the classic uh, drug licensing deal. But having said all of that, I think that part of the great contribution of a day like today and the ongoing dialogue is, and, and I hope you take this up, is for people like Asaf and Shlomo to sit down and actually come up with some solutions rather than saying, you know, we're right, you're wrong, you're wrong, we're right, that's not going to get you anywhere. But I do think that in addition to the changing role of universities, there is very clearly a changing role of the technology transfer component and the innovation component and the venture component, and now would be a very good time uh, to give that input. So that's my only... This program was brought to you by Kola Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University.